diabetes and pre-diabetes. About 19% to 45% in the general population between 45 to 64 years of age group. What about when it's over 65 years of group? 29% and 49% respectively have diabetes or pre-diabetes. That's almost half of the population that's over 65 years of age when a study done in 2017 up to 2020. With these astonishing numbers, it's not surprising approximately 10 to 12 million people in the U.S. have peripheral arterial disease, PAD a major complication of diabetes mellitus. It is estimated 11% of those ages between 40 and older have peripheral arterial disease. 2.5% between 40 to 60 years, 8% between 60 to 70 years, and astonishing 20% in those over 70 years of age group. PAD for many can lead to something as serious as amputation. Limb loss prevalence, 500 approximately amputations a day, 186,000 a year, and an overall population of 2.1 million US amputees, according to one analysis from 15 years of data. But thanks to the incredible advances in medical sciences, there is hope on the horizon. And that's what our show is all about today. Welcome to another episode of Khan Clinics, powered by the health section of American Muslim Today. I'm your host, Dr. Amir Khan. Today's guest is one of the leading voices in this space, Dr. Anahita Dua, a vascular surgeon at Massachusetts General Hospital, an associate professor at Harvard Medical School and the director of several vascular related programs, including the limb evaluation and amputation program. She has over 200 publications in reviewed papers and a work in preventing amputation, diabetic mention and diabetic diseases is changing lives. Dr. Dua, we're excited to have you on show with us. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Dr. Dua, let's start off by a recognition question. People that are out there with diabetes don't realize how at risk they might be. What are some of the early signs they should look out for? Like how can they catch things before it becomes serious? So specifically peripheral artery disease which we call PAD, P-A-D, affects the lower blood vessels that affect your legs. And, you know, the way that we unfortunately think about the vascular system is we think my heart will give me a heart attack, my neck blood vessels will give me a stroke, and my leg blood vessels can give me an amputation. But actually, the disease process, which is blockage of these arteries, is the same no matter what vascular bed you're looking at. So what PAD is is blockage of the blood vessels in the legs. And diabetes specifically is a disease that affects mm -hmm. the inner lining of all blood vessels and causes this mountain of plaque or rock, it's really calcium, within the blood vessel blocking off flow. So if you have blockage of flow in the heart, you get that heart attack. If you have blockage of flow in the neck, you get that stroke. And if you have blockage of flow in the legs, you get gangrene because you don't get enough blood flow to the toes. And ultimately, that's what leads to amputation. So early signs in patients that have diabetes really come in the form of pain, especially in the feet, pain when you walk in the calf muscles that goes away when you stop. But honestly, unfortunately, this disease can be silent in the beginning, which means it's very important for diabetics to check their feet and make sure that they don't have any wounds that are not healing, because that is an early sign of lack of blood flow to that particular area. Excellent. We appreciate that. Something to check there. PAD is more common than people think. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure many of our listeners are wondering, what can they do to protect themselves? For someone managing diabetes, what would be the best steps to reduce this risk of developing PAD? Diet, exercise, combination? What really makes a difference? That's an excellent question. So it depends on where you are in the spectrum. Once you get that diagnosis of diabetes, immediately lifestyle modifications that include number one, if you smoke, immediately stop smoking. Number two, stop strong control of your diabetes, which will include not only diet, but also sometimes medications, including insulin. 
There's no shame in taking insulin, especially when you're dealing with the South Asian community, because unfortunately there is a genetic predisposition to having this disease process. So, you know, sometimes our grandmothers will say, oh, you know, just change your diet. That's true to some extent. But for people that have, unfortunately, the genetic component, ensuring that they're taking their medications to control their blood sugar is fundamentally important. Also, controlling blood pressure. Why? Because remember I said diabetes damages the inner lining of the blood vessel? Well, high blood pressure also damages the inside. Imagine the pounding against that wall every day from the day you're born to the day you die. And so controlling the power of that pounding by reducing your blood pressure is fundamentally important. And exercise allows that to happen. You know, a lot of times we say, oh, go exercise. But what are we really saying? What we're really saying is by exercising, you're reducing that blood pressure. You're making the cholesterol lower in your body so that they cannot build those mounds of plaque inside your blood vessel and ultimately stop the progression of PAD so that you never end up facing an amputation. Excellent. Let me pass on or move on to another little area. What tools do you use to assess um, PAD? And tell us a little bit if there has been any advances in this area that's starting to make a difference. Absolutely. So first of all, I'll say the word PAD is sort of like the word cancer. What I mean by that is if I tell you I have cancer, the first question you're going to ask me is what type of cancer? If I have pancreatic cancer, that's very different than saying I have skin cancer. Similarly, PAD is an umbrella term that encompasses two different groups. A group of patients that have what's called intermittent claudication, which is just Latin for it hurts when I walk. And a group of patients that have rest pain, which means they're sitting around and their foot really hurts and they potentially have a wound that is not healing. If you are in the second group of a patient that has rest pain or a non-healing wound, that is critical limb ischemia, which is the step before an amputation. So a patient that is in that bucket, the type of tools that we have to assess their blood flow ranges from a physical examination where we touch the foot and we feel for a pulse, we examine the wound, and then we move forward to something called an ABI or ankle brachial index. What that is, is every part of your body, whether it's the tip of your toes or the tip of your nose, should have the same blood pressure. But if you have blockages in your leg, the blood pressure will decrease, decrease, decrease until it's basically zero by the time it reaches the toes. So what we can do is check the blood pressure in your arm and compare it to the blood pressure in your ankle. And if there is a discrepancy, it tells me, the doctor, this person has PAD. Now I'll need to know how severe is it. And depending on the discrepancy between the actual arm blood pressure and the foot blood pressure, I can say how severe your PAD is. If you fall into a severe category, then I move to the next step of diagnosis, which is an angiogram. That is where we bring you in as the doctor. We lie you down on the table, give you a little bit of medication to just make you kind of woozy so you don't get a tube in your throat or anything. But we put a small needle into the blood vessel and we shoot dye down the leg. And the dye acts like blood, which I can see on the x-ray machine. And if the blood is getting hung up in different areas of the leg, I know, yes, there is a blockage here, there is a blockage there. And it shows me, if you have a wound, let's say, on your toe, how much blood is getting to that wound. And based on that, I then treat you. Excellent. You mentioned a term, critical limb ischemia. And you mentioned that is something just before the leg dies. It's critical. Could you explain a little bit more about that? Is that a sign, oh, my leg may get amputated because now it's dying? Or is there something else to it? Excellent question. Actually, so I will say as a blanket statement, when somebody has critical leg ischemia or CLI, that is absolutely a flashing warning sign that your leg may get amputated. It is a medical urgency. I won't say emergency. You don't need to be rushed to the emergency room at two o'clock in the morning, but you should come by eight o'clock in the morning because you need to be evaluated because what is happening is there is a cutoff of blood to the leg where the leg is in a critical situation where it doesn't have enough blood flow to even survive. So slowly, slowly from the toes to the ankle to the leg, it'll start to die. Now, mm. if you're dealing with critical ischemia in the heart, you're going to have a big heart attack. And you're going to dial 911 and you're going to go to the ER. If you have critical ischemia of the brain, it's because you have that stroke. Again, you're going to dial 911 and go to the ER. But if you have critical ischemia of the leg, a lot of people think, oh, I got this wound on my foot. 
ah, it's been there for two months and it's not healing. Oh, maybe I'll just wait another month. But that's the danger. You cannot because actually that's critical ischemia of the leg and it needs a doctor to intervene to increase blood flow to that area or it's going to keep spreading to the point of potentially no return and an amputation. Thank you for explaining that. So critical leg ischemia is really critical and that's the time when you're headed towards an amputation. If you do not have something done. Dr. Dua, patients, when they hear that word amputation, they get freaked out. And I'm sure for you, that's one of the hardest conversation you want to have with a patient. And, and you see their stunned faces. How do you guide someone through that decision? And what should the patient and the family have to understand before they make that choice or understanding? That's a fantastic question also. So first of all, let me classify two types of amputation. We classify amputation as minor amputation or major amputation. Minor amputation means cutting off of a toe or cutting off of all of the toes. And a major amputation is doing an amputation of the leg below the knee or above the knee. Now, why is this really important? Because sometimes you do have to make a sacrifice of the toe in order to save the leg. Sometimes you have to make a sacrifice of all the toes in order to save the leg. So the word amputation means different things. Now, I'll also say I'm the director of our limb preservation program at the Mass General at Harvard. And what I tell my patients is, why do you have your leg? You have your leg because you want to be functional, because you want to go out with your family, play with your grandchildren. That's why you have your leg. So if you have a festering dead leg that's not allowing you to even get out of bed, and I tell you, "Let, let me remove your leg. But then in this day and age, because of the advances in prosthetics, in six weeks, I'm going to get you standing up on a prosthetic. Wouldn't that be better? Because the problem is, you gave some statistics in the beginning, 65-year-old patients and above, in that group of patients, 50% of patients will be dead after getting an amputation if they're above the age of 65. Now, it's not because of the actual amputation. It's not like I do the amputation and that kills the patient. It's because if you're doing an amputation on somebody, it means globally their vascular health is so bad that they're probably within the next two years going to die of a heart attack or stroke, which means that if I can remove the leg and give you a prosthetic and you get to now go back to exercising, now go back to living your normal life, not being depressed, taking the right medications, you can live another 40 years. So what I tell my patients is don't think that's the end of the road. Quite the opposite. An amputation many times is done to save your life and give you the rest of it back. But the real goal should be, ideally, we never have this conversation. The minute that someone is diagnosed with diabetes, they should be sitting with a vascular specialist and planning the way you plan your retirement, the way you plan the rest of your planning. Okay, what can happen and how can I intervene to reduce the chances that I'm going to have to face this problem. And if I do face the problem, how can I find the right doctor that's going to quickly be able to intervene to keep my leg attached to my body for as long as possible, functionally? Thank you for explaining that. So you really want prevention. You really want to prevent that leg to getting to that critical limb ischemia stage, Mm. recognizing your symptoms early and treating them. So that explains us a lot of... uh, ambiguity that is out there about the amputation part. Amputation doesn't necessarily mean the end of the world. It may be the start of another new bit in your life. Let's move on to the next question. You've done some amazing work on how blood clots can complicate surgeries, especially when they are revascularized. For someone who's had that surgery and had that blood flow restored, how do you help make their recovery smoother? And are there things the patient can do to avoid these post-surgical complications? So there's two ways to get blood flow really back to a patient's leg. One is the classic bypass, where we make a cut on your leg and think of it like a car accident on a road. Imagine the police come and there's a car accident on the road. What do the police do? They detour the cars from the good road to the good road, bypassing the accident. We do the same thing. If you have a blockage somewhere, we take a graft and we actually connect good artery to good artery. Hmm? Okay. Sometimes, because of the what we call the endovascular revolution, there's been a lot of new technology that's come out there, we're actually able to put a wire and a stent through the area that's blocked, open it up, and then get you blood flow all from inside the blood vessel. And it's all dependent on the anatomy of the patient, when they show up. There are a lot of things to it, which a good doctor will sit and explain to you, certainly like myself. But 
The most important thing is now, after we've done the procedure to you, whether you have the cuts on the leg or you have just a tiny poke and the stent, you now have to maintain that new blood flow. Otherwise, it was pointless. And why? Because there's data that shows if a diabetic patient has a wound on the foot, it takes approximately 200 days from the day that they get new blood flow to heal the wound. So if I do your procedure today, I need for at least the next year, excellent blood flow so your wound heals. So the big question becomes, how do we maintain this flow? Now, right now in the world, unfortunately, what happens is if you have a surgery and I have a surgery, even though you're a man and I'm a woman, we're different ages, we may get special surgery for both of our special anatomy. But then after surgery, we're both going to get the same blood thinner to keep our blood flow going. And that's sure. not right because we're not personalizing it. And this one size fits all doesn't work. So my lab specifically has got NIH funding to figure out how to personalize blood thinner. And we're actually very far along. Five years we've been doing this. We've published a lot on this. And um, what we're currently in the phase of doing is randomizing patients to a special tailored program that we give them blood thinner based on checking their blood and seeing what they need versus just the one size fits all. And we've really found, of course, when you personalize that there's incredible benefits because you're able to kind of keep people in a sweet spot very similar to diabetic control. You don't want to be 500 blood sugar. You don't want to be sure. 50. You want to be 100. Same thing with the blood thinner. On top of the maintenance also, you want to keep moving around in terms of enhancing that circulation so that you can keep the blood moving and not clotting. And you want to maintain immediately after your procedure, if you have any cuts or wounds, a very nice hygiene regimen so that they do not get infected. Because the worst thing that can happen, honestly, moving down the line is the bypass graft or the stent gets an infection because that unfortunately will require a much bigger surgery. And sometimes patients don't have the blood flow to heal from something like that. So these are the, really the main things, taking the medications that you're prescribed to keep it going, ensuring that you have a nice hygienic recovery and moving sure. around to maintain the circulation. Excellent. So personalized blood thinner therapy sounds very appealing. Mm -hmm. And then you said your post-operative is a little bit more aggressive. You're monitoring the diet control, keeping the diabetes under control. You're a little bit more aggressive with that. All of these little things contribute and help healing. You've, would you like to describe how technology is playing some role in patient's care? So that's what the overall question is about. And what tools are being developed there that are helping vascular surgeons like you and for your patients to help walk further and heal faster. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about what, what are the changes that are on the horizons and how would it affect the patient from day to day lives? We have an explosion of technology, luckily, that's it, really working in different realms. When we're talking about kind of the monitoring and surveillance, currently we use ultrasound to take a look at the patient's bypass, for example, and we can measure the velocity, the quickness of the blood through the graft to determine whether or not the graft is what we call threatened, like it's going to clot off. And if we can catch it before it actually shuts down, we can really preserve that graft for another few years. Sort of like imagine taking your car out and your, your, your check engine light comes on before the whole car just stops in the highway. Better you see the light and you go and fix it, right? We have a lot of technology that does that, that kind of catches when a patient is going to have a problem and then the doctor can intervene quickly. In terms of wound healing, there has been an explosion again of technologies that range all the way from using amniotic tissue and different types of coverings because unfortunately in the diabetic patient, we don't have the luxury of quick wound healing. So if someone has an amputation, it may take instead of two months to heal, and you and me in a diabetic, it's going to take six months to heal. Now, even if the wound is small, slowly, slowly healing, in that time, you can get an infection and that can ruin everything. So having a nice covering over the area that's not fully healed is fundamentally important. And some of these special wound technologies can allow for that. We're also doing a lot of experimentation on looking at temperature of the skin, flow under the skin to determine which patients are going to get wounds in certain areas based on the pressure of their feet. And if we know that, then we put them in special shoes that offload the particular area that's getting the brunt of the pressure when they walk, thereby preventing any wound from ever starting in the first place. And ultimately, as you mentioned earlier, prevention is the key to everything in this particular game. Wow. Dr. Dua. So ultrasound, wound healing, temperature monitoring is just, like you said, there seems a lot out there and it seems very encouraging for people who are suffering this. So thank you very much for 
explaining and thank you very much for doing all of that good work. So you better keep thank on you. doing that good work for us, please. We really appreciate. How about we'll move on to machine learning a little bit. Mm. Tell us a little bit about how the data is being incorporated. How is machine learning in your specific field that is complex vascular issues? What's on the horizon for that? What are their predictive tools that you're looking at? And how is it helping you as a surgeon to predict what wound is going to heal or not and which ones are going to need surgery or not? That's a fantastic question. Across medical science currently, machine learning and the concept of being able to predict, therefore being able to prevent, is really the name of the game. And one of the things, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we've sort of been grouping patients all into this umbrella of PAD. But now with more and more people living longer with diabetes, we're seeing more and more people that are quite different from each other. Like one person may have perfectly controlled blood sugar, yet unfortunately get gangrene because there are genetic polymorphisms that drove them to that. And somebody else may smoke their whole life and get nothing, even though they've got diabetes. And being able to ascertain why did this patient do this and why did this patient do that is really key. And that's where machine learning comes into play. Because the way machine learning works is you can put a huge a variety of data in and the machine learning itself can sort out what are the patterns that are being seen that ultimately lead to particular outcomes. And it doesn't necessarily even have to be patient driven. It could be something as simple as, hey, for some reason, patients in the Southeast are having more amputations than patients in the North. Okay, then you drill down on that and you basically compare each group and identify, oh, okay, the crux of the issue is, you know, you'd asked a technology question earlier, um, there's a new technology out called deep venous arterialization, which is a very brand new thing that we actually do to try to shunt blood in the diabetic foot down so that the patients who otherwise would have been amputated can now potentially save their foot. But patient selection is really fundamental. Which patient? Because if you pick the wrong one and you do that procedure to them, you can accelerate getting an amputation. So machine learning can step in here and you know you can data dump from across the country hundreds of thousands of data points without any real question, but the machine itself can start to teach which patients are most likely to have what. And then eventually the goal is that it could tell you an algorithm that you could follow so that you can stop the patient again from ever reaching the point of gangrene. Wow. I might say one thing, your, your passion in the field is very evident. <laughs> thank you. And I want to <laughs> applaud you for, for that. So Thank you for coming on and telling our audience about this. It really means a lot to us as well. Let me move on to the next question. A little bit about, about your work in uh, socioeconomics and how you've looked at things with people with marginal, low socioeconomics and how are there changes that need to be made in the healthcare system so that everyone from any background can get good health care, and especially in this field where diabetes, PAD, a lot of them are from a, an underprivileged or a lower socioeconomics. Tell us a, a little bit about that and then enrich our audience about what your work you've done. This is actually a very important topic, very important, because, sure. you know, with health disparities, unfortunately, what's happened is we, we really have a two tier system, certainly in the United States, you know, in terms of who can get health care and who can't. But what's interesting is there's also a subset of patients that do get health care, but they don't get the same health care. So, for example, there is data published that um, a white patient, for example, that is uh, seen by a doctor is given the option of revascularization up to six times before an amputation is brought on to the to the to the discussion. But a black patient will be given um, a discussion about revascularization only two times before amputation is brought into the conversation. And there are many reasons right. for that. This is not a statement of, oh, people are racist. It's not that. What it is about is there is a major difference in kind of the approach to healthcare in different groups, which is wrong. And I actually wrote an, uh, an op-ed that was published in the New York Times called My Patient Didn't Have to Die This Way just a few months ago that was about this concept and about the idea that actually it should stem from the government and protocols. I mentioned earlier when we were discussing that one of the things that we do for patients that have critical leg ischemia is we do an angiogram. The angiogram is when we shoot the dye and we see where the blockage is, and then I can go on to treat you. So anybody that has this 
issue with gangrene should get an angiogram unless they are in a threatened position where they're going to die because they're already septic. But most patients don't present that way. But in America today, I'm actually the PI, which is the primary investigator on a big national study called Clarity, where we're looking at patients that have presented with critical limb ischemia. In America today, 73% of the patients that get an amputation have never had an angiogram, which is insane. And that bleeds into the whole idea that imagine if something like Medicare said, you know what, we are not going to reimburse for an amputation unless the patient has had an angiogram. Suddenly, people are still going to start to get equal health care. I mean, of course, you can say, well, what about this and what about that? But for the most part, we're not going to be looking at statistics of 73% are not getting the care that they need. And so I think really the crux of the socioeconomic disparity, we need to move away from going to doctor conferences where we put up slides and show, oh my goodness, if you're a black patient, this happens to you, that you're Hispanic, this happens to you if you're white. And then it ends with doctors don't be more racist. We need to do something systemic to change it. And yes, there is an issue with patient education, but there's also a major responsibility, I feel, of the government in order to set up rules and protocols so that everyone's getting the same level of care. Excellent and well said, and you've put it exactly where it belonged. I think you've explained it very nicely. So thank you very much for explaining that part. Dr. Tua, finally, I, I want to have you have a say of what's at the forefront right now in advancements. What's your vision? Where do you see vascular surgery is headed? And what breakthroughs do you see coming in the next few years? I think there are two areas that are going to have some major breakthroughs. One, in the actual technology space, I had mentioned the deep venous arterialization. This is a brand new thing where we can go with a little poke in the foot and a little poke in the groin and make a connection in the middle of the leg, allowing arterialized oxygenated blood to be shunted into the veins of the leg and get down to the foot. It's a mouthful of stuff, but it basically means that patients that otherwise would have been amputated have now an opportunity to potentially save their leg. Simultaneously, what I see in the next 20 years is there's a brand new way of now we're, we're starting to dabble in injecting stem cells and different right. medications directly into the foot to allow for what we call neo-revascularization, new development of blood vessels. So that patients that may not have any blood vessels in the foot currently, we can inject these stem cells and they can potentially wow. grow new blood vessels and get out of the gangrene phase. And right now it sounds like science fiction, but science fiction is typically right. where all of this starts anyway. I also think that there's going to be an extreme role for personalization. Again, that's the research I work on. And we're going to move away from kind of what we are in right now, which is almost a 1950s approach to PAD. And the reason for that is because right now, if you go out into public, we actually just did a survey on this. You go right into the public and you say, do you know what a heart attack is? Yes. Do you know what a stroke is? Yes. Do you know what PAD is? 70% of people don't know. Because it's not been out there in education, even though it kills more people than some of the top cancers combined. So now I think right. with more patient education, more funding into the NIH to study these diseases, not at the end stage, but at the early stage, prevention, that's going to change the landscape of vascular disease for the better. Excellent. I wish we had more time, but we ran out of the time we've had. Dr. Dua. Thank you so much for sharing your time, your expertise. It's been a fantastic eye opener for me and the audience that are listening and watching. Thank you. To all our listeners out there, thank you for tuning into another episode of Khan Clinics. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Do share it with someone who could contribute or benefit from this talk. Until then, I want to wish all of my audience stay safe, stay happy. 